This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Voodoo Planet by Andre Norton. Chapter 6 They withdrew to a spot hacked from the edge of the jungle, leaving a screen of green between them and the traitorous upslope. But within the few hours of daylight left them, it was proven that Asaki had been overly optimistic in his hopes of discovering a water tree. They were now in a narrow tongue of land between the range and the swamps, and this territory was limited. Naimani, still shaken, was of little help, and the spacemen did not dare to strike out into unexplored land alone. So they mouthed dry concentrates and dared not drink. Dane was tempted to pour out the liquid in his canteen. Water so close to hand was a continual torment. And now that they were away from the heights and the possibility of more finger-shaped rocks, surely the thread in that moisture was small in comparison to the needs of his body. Only that caution, which was drilled into every free trader, supplied a break to his thirst. Jellico drew the back of his hand across cracked lips. Suppose we should draw lots. Some of us drink, one or two not. Could we manage that way until we were over the mountains? I wouldn't want to chance it, unless we are left with no other choice. There's no way of telling how long the drug works. Frankly, right now I'm not even sure I could detect a hallucination for very long under these conditions, was Tao's discouraging verdict. If any of them slept that night, they did so only in snatches. The apprehension which had come with the previous night was back, intensified, and that lurking, indefinable fear rode them hard. They were shaken out of their private terrors shortly before dawn. There were always sounds to be heard in the jungle, the cries of unseen birds, the crash of some tree eaten alive by parasitic sapping. But what broke now was no bird call, no isolated tree falling. A trumpeting roar, the cracking smash of vegetation, heralded a real menace. Asaki spun to face northward, though there was nothing to be seen there except the unshaken wall of the jungle. Graz! Graz on stampede! Naimani joined his superior. Jellico arose swiftly and Dane read on the captain's face the seriousness of this. The off-worlder turned to his own men with a sharp order. "'On your feet! We may have to move on the double. Up mountain?' he demanded of the chief ranger. The other was still listening, not only with his ears, but with the whole of his tense body. Three of the deer-like creatures they had hunted for food broke out of the green wall, fled past the men as if the latter was invisible and behind them, the hunted now and not the hunter, came a lion, its strikingly marked black-and-white hide dramatic in the light of the morning. It showed fangs in a snarl, and then was gone in one huge bound. More deer things, scurrying of other small creatures, moving too fast for clear identification, and behind them, the fury of destruction which marked the headlong advance of Katka's largest mammals slamming through the jungle. They had started upslope when Naimani cried out. A white bulk, hard to distinguish in that light against the gray of the earth, headed after them. Dane had a fleeting glimpse of curled tusks, of an open mouth, raw red and wide enough to engulf his whole head, of shaggy legs driving at an unbelievable pace. Asaki snapped a beam from the needler. The white monster roared and came on. They dived for the scant cover offered as the Graz bull died, not two yards away from the chief ranger, its heavy body skidding along the earth with the force of its speed as it went down. That did it, Jellico sighted coolly with his blaster as a second bull, fighting mad, tore from the jungle and pounded at them. Behind it, a third tusked head thrust out of the brush, 
Large eyes searched for an enemy. Dane studied the dead bull, but the animal did not come to life this time. These were not hallucinations. And the malignancy of the rock apes, the cunning of the native Kotkan lion, were pallid things compared to a graz herd on the rampage. The second bull yelped with an almost canine complaint as Jellicoe's blaster caught it head on. Blinded, the beast blundered ahead, climbing the mountainside. The third met a ray from Naimani's needler. But the chief ranger leaped from behind his sheltering rock to the one where the captain had taken refuge and pulled him into the open. They must not corner us here. Jellicoe agreed to that. Come on, he barked to Tau and Dane. They fled along a rough way, trying to gain altitude, but finding a rising cliff wall which could not be easily climbed. Two more Gras went down, one badly wounded, one safely dead. Behind them more white heads came from the brush. What original cause had started the stampede the fugitives could not guess, but now the fear and anger of the animals was centering upon them. And in spite of their efforts, the party was being herded into a pocket, between the jungle below, where the main body of Graz crashed along, and a steep wall. Given time to find the necessary finger and toe holds, a man might climb that wall, but they could not attempt it now. The portion of ledge on which they ran, stopped to fire, and then ran on again, angled to the southeast. And so they came to its end quickly, a drop ending in a plain of yellow-gray mud studded with clumps of bleached vegetation, which led, like stepping-stones, toward a tangle of matted, sickly-looking plants and reeds. "'All right,' Tal faced around. "'What do we do now? Space lift? And using what for wings or jets?' As if the grass could sense that they now had their victims safely cornered, what must have been a goodly segment of the herd hooked their way from the jungle and started up. Puffing, digging in those sturdy legs which had to take the massive weight of their barrel-shaped bodies, they made their way determinedly upgrade. One might almost believe that they had intelligently planned this end for their drive. "'We go down!' Asaki yelled and used his needler on the leader of that climbing platoon. "'The Brush Islands,' Naimani amended. "'I show you.' He thrust his needler at Jellicoe and was over the edge of the ledge, hanging by his hands and swinging his weight back and forth like a pendulum. At the upswing of his body to the right, he let go and plunged out, landing half across one of the reed islets. The Kotkin clawed his way to his knees, gained his feet, and leaped for the next bit of solid ground. "'You, Thorson!' Jellicoe jerked his head at Dane, and the younger spaceman holstered his fire-ray, slipped gingerly over the drop, and prepared to repeat Naimani's feat as best he could. He was not quite as successful with his sidewise swing, landing with only his forearms across the islet, the rest of his body being swiftly embedded in what was ooze, covered only with a thin crust of dried matter. The stench of the stuff was sickening, but the fear of being entrapped in it gave him the necessary impetus to push forward, though what was meant to be a swift half-dive was more of a worm's progress. He grabbed frantically at brittle stems, at coarse grass which cut like knives at his hands. But some of the material held, and he lay face down on a lump which did not give under his weight. There was no time to linger. He had to get to the next patch, to free this dubious landing place for the men embattled on the rise above. Stumbling up, Dane judged the distance with a space-trained eye, and jumped to a knob Naimani had already quitted. The Kotkin was more than halfway along toward that promise of solid ground which the tangled mass of leprous vegetation led to, zigzagging expertly from islet to islet. There was a crash and a roar behind. Dane balanced on the third of the minute islands to look back. He saw the lash of blaster fire on the top of the cliff, Tau on his knees on the first of their chain of stepping-stones, and a graz sprawled head and forequarters in the sucking muck, where it had dived past the two defenders above. Needler and Blaster fired together again. 
and then Jellicoe swung over the cliff rim. Tao waved vigorously and Dane took off for the next islet, just making it by lucky chance. The rest of the journey he took in a rush, trying not to think of anything but the necessity of landing on some spot of firm ground. His last leap of all was too short, so that he went knee-deep in a particularly evil-smelling pool where yellow scum spattered his breeches, and he experienced the insidious pull of the bottomless stuff. A stout branch whipped across his shoulder and he caught it. With Naimani's wiry strength on the other end, Dane worked free and sat, white-faced and shivering, on a mat of brush, while the Kotkin hunter turned his attention to the safety of Tao, the next arrival. More fortunate, or more skillful, than Dane, the medic made the hop from the last tuft without mishap. But he was blowing heavily as he collapsed beside the other spaceman. Together they watched the progress of their captain. Safe on the second tussock from the shore, Jellicoe halted, edged carefully around, and used the needler Naimani had left with him. A shaggy head tossed, and the bull fronting a sake on the cliff went down. The chief ranger dodged quickly to the right, and a second beast rushed out and over, to join its mired comrade in the swamp below. As Jellicoe shot again, the Kotkin slung his needler, and went over to gain the first islet. One more graz was wounded, but luckily it hunched about, turning its formidable tusks on those that followed, thus keeping the path clear for its enemies. Jellicoe was making the journey, sure-footedly, with the chief ranger only one hillock behind. Tao sighed. Some day maybe this will be just another tall tale, and we'll all be thought liars when we spout it, he observed. That is, if we survive to tell it. So, now which way do we go? If I had my choice, it would be up. When Dane pulled himself to his feet and surveyed their small refuge, he was ready to agree to that. For the space, packed with dead and dying vegetable matter until one sank calf-deep, was a triangle with a narrow point running east into the swamp. They don't give up easily, do they? Jellicoe looked back to the shore and the cliff. Though the wounded Graz bull still held the heights against its fellows, there were others breaking from the jungle on the lower level, wandering back and forth to paw the earth, rip up soil with their tusks, and otherwise threaten anyone who would try to return to the strip they patrolled. They will not, Asaki answered bleakly. Arouse a Graz and it will trail you for days. Kill any of the herd and you have little hope of escaping them on foot. It would seem now that the swamp was a deterrent to pursuit. The two beasts that had fallen in the mire moaned in a pitiful rising note. They had ceased to struggle, and several of their kind clustered on the shore near them, calling entreatingly. Asaki took careful aim with the needler and put one animal after another out of its misery. But the flash of those shots angered those on the shore to a higher pitch of rage. No going back he said, at least not for several days. Tao slapped a black, four-winged insect which had settled on his arm, its jaws wide open for a sampling bite. "'We can't very well perch here until they forget all about us,' he pointed out. "'Not without water we can trust, and with the local wildlife ready to test us for tasty eating.' Naimani had prowled along the swampward point of their island, and now he made his report. There is more highland to the east. Perhaps it will give us a bridge across." At that moment Dane doubted his ability to make any more leaps from island to island, and it would seem Tao shared his discouragement. "'I don't suppose you could discourage our friends on shore there with a few more shots?' Asaki shook his head. "'We do not have clips enough to settle a whole herd. These might retreat from sight but they would be waiting for us in the bush, and that would mean certain death. We shall have to take the swamp road." If Dane had considered their earlier march misery, this was sheer torture. Since footing was never secure, falls were frequent, and within a quarter hour 
they were all plastered with evil-smelling slime and mud which hardened to rock consistency when exposed to the air. Painful as this was, it did protect a portion of their bodies from the insects with which the swamp was well stocked. And in spite of their efforts to find a way out, the only possible paths led them deeper into the center of the unexplored morass. At last Asaki called a halt and a council to consider retreat. To locate an island from which they could at least watch the shore appealed very strongly indeed. "'We have to have water,' Tao's voice was a harsh croak, issuing out of a mask of green mud festooned with trailing weeds. "'This ground is rising,' Asaki smacked the stock of his needler against the surface on which he crouched. "'I think perhaps there may be clean land soon to come.' Jellico hitched his way up a sapling, now bending under his weight. Through the vision lenses he studied the route ahead. "'You're right about that,' he called to the chief ranger. "'There's a showing of the right sort of green to the left, about half a mile on. And,' he glanced about at the westering sun, "'we have about an hour yet of good light in which to make it. I wouldn't try such a run after dark.' The promise of green bolstered their weary spirits for a last exhausting effort. Once again they were faced with a series of islet leaps, and now they carried with them brush culled from the bigger tussocks to aid in times of need. When Dane scrambled up the last pull, staggered and went down to his knees again, he knew he was done. He did not even move at an excited cry from Naimani, echoed a moment later by Asaki. It was not until the latter leaned over him, a canteen open in his hand, that Dane aroused a little. "'Drink,' the Kotkin urged. "'We have found a water-tree. This is fresh.' The liquid might have been fresh, but it also had a peculiar taste, which Dane did not note until he had gulped down a generous swallow. At that moment, he was past caring about anything but the fact that he did have a portion of drinkable stuff in hand. Here the stunted, unnatural growth of the swamplands had given away to the more normal vegetation of the jungle-clad lowlands. Had they come clear across the swamp, Dane wondered, dully, or was this only a large island in the midst of the stinking boglands? He drank again and regained strength enough to crawl to where his shipmates lay. It was some time before he was interested in much besides the fact that he could drink when he wished. Then he watched Jellicoe waver to his feet, his head turned eastward. Tao, too, sat up, as if alerted by the Queen's alarm buzzer. The Kotkins were gone, perhaps back to the water-tree. But all three of the spacemen heard that sound, a far-off throbbing rhythm which was a vibration as well. Jellicoe looked to Tao. Drums? Could be. The medic screwed the cap back on his canteen. I'd say we have company, only I'd like to know what kind. They might have been mistaken about the drums, but none of them could have been mistaken about the bolt which came out of nowhere to slice through a tree trunk as a knife might slash wet clay. Blaster, and a particular type of blaster. Patrol issue! Tao lay flat, squeezing himself against the earth, as if he wished he could ooze into it. Jellico wriggled toward the bush in answer to a low call from Asaki, and the others made a worm's progress in his wake. Under cover, they found the chief ranger readying his needler. Poacher camp here, he explained bleakly, and they know about us. A perfect end to a stinking day! remarked Tao dispassionately. We might have guessed something of this sort was waiting. He tried to rub away some of the dried clay coating his chin. But do poachers use drums? The chief ranger scowled. That is what Naimani has gone to find out. End of chapter 6